This session will explore intergenerational perspectives on empowering human security education and the changes needed in education to prepare future leaders for a more sustainable world. It is incredible Mark Buckley, environmentalist, SDG advocate, ecological economist, regener regenerative futurist. So Mark, could you please tell us what does the world that works for everyone looks like to you? And tell us a little bit more about training and journey as a crew member of Spaceship Earth. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with these other wonderful distinguished speakers and uh, experts and on such an important topic. Um, I'm an educator myself, uh, but uh, as was mentioned, uh, an ecological econ economist and a regenerative futurist. Well, what does that mean? Um, for the United Nations, for the World Economic Forum, for the World Government Summit, for international organizations who are wondering what the future is, what the goals are, and how we get there, I... Um, advise and consult them and really conduct workshops on what a world that works for everyone looks like for us and how to get to that future. So I wrote the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal Manifesto for the United Nations. And I wrote that specifically because when we see the United Nations goals and, and uh, some people are like, oh, bubblegum colors. Wow, that's interesting. They don't know if they're for cities, countries, nations, uh, corporations, or who they're for. Uh, well, they're for us individually. They're the world's first global moonshot, the world's first earth shot. It's a, a, a moment of historical precedence, never occurred before in human history. We had 197 countries come together for the first time ever and agree upon a people planet protection plan, a roadmap to get us or keep us at 1.5 degrees of warming by December 2030. But they couldn't envision that. And so I, I wrote the manifesto so that they could have a vision what it would feel like for themselves to stand in a world December 2030 that had achieved all the sustainable development goals and what it would feel like to them. Um, and that's what I do for these other international organizations. I do workshops. I wanna ask you a kind of a question. Have you ever noticed or wondered what happens after the sustainable development goals? What happens after the Paris Agreement in December, 2030? Well, Surprise, there's other goals, just like before the Sustainable Development Goals, there was the Millennium Development Goals. Afterwards, there's what we call the Re Resilient Development Goals. And it was a program started in 2019 called Resilience Frontiers. And so in order to get to those goals and to think about that future, we use foresight and futurism tools in order to do that. And so... <clears throat> That's what I do at, uh, at international organizations, kind of saying, what's the, the future we want to go to? And that's why that question, what does a world that works for everyone look like to me is so important? Because if we don't know the answer to that, who's guiding us on the path of our future? Is it our cities, our governments? Is it our countries? Who is leading that future? And the other thing is, if you don't know it for yourself, how are you holding anyone accountable if it's going if the world that you live in or the place you live in is going in a different direction? And I really think that's a, a, a vital question um, to ask yourself because if you would like the world to go in a different direction than the one the world that you live in or the community that you live in, then it's time to let your voice be heard that you're uncomfortable. You're not happy with the way things are going so that you can get the world, that, the future that you want to live in. Um, I, I want to give you a, a few thoughts because it's really important to think about uh, the future of education and where we're going. 
Uh, sadly, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, just shortly after the pandemic started, four years ago almost now, um, it was crazy because Sir Ken Robinson, probably one of the biggest educators and promoters of the future of education and where we should go, passed away. And he'd set some pretty clear visions and things that we should do and, and ways that we could work and what the future of education should look like. There's one problem. It doesn't matter what the future of any education system or ideas that we come up with if they're run on an old civilization framework, if they're run on an old infrastructure that is the same business as usual or the way that we've done it throughout all the civilizations previous to us. Now, when I say civilizations previous to us, a lot of people say, what's he talking about? And that's one big big thing that we don't always learn in school that is a that is a big big thing nasa did a study in 2008 and then again in 2014 to see how many civilization frameworks our world has had before and there is exactly 32 that the study came back that we know of civilization frameworks that existed, but don't exist anymore. They all collapsed. You might know some of them, early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztecs, Mayas, the Greeks, the Romans, on and on. There's 32 of them. Well, all of those civilization frameworks collapsed besides three of them because they were because of ecological or environmental collapse, because of basic needs, resources, infrastructure, food, water, uh, just the basics. And three of them collapse because of displacement, disruption, or disease. That's interesting fact, but there's an even interesting fact. All 32 of them collapse because they were running the exact same model, the exact same model, the exact same civilization framework model. And I'm going to show it to you now. It's a hierarchy, it's a pyramid, it's a hierarchy where one ruler, emperor, president, king is at the top and peasants, slaves and laborers and those who are being educated are at the bottom holding up that entire pyramid. That is a civilization framework model that will always end up in failure. The reason I bring that up is if we come up with the best STEM or um, different intergenerational um, models for education, if we come up with all sorts of new innovations around education and we put it on an old civilization framework that doesn't have that infrastructure, I promise you it's only gonna last a short time until it collapses again. Um, what I wanted to tell you is that currently there's 617 million young learners in our world. And there are 244 million children out of school. If we take those young learners that I'm talking about, we're talking kindergarten, preschool, first and second grade students, which are 617 million young learners in our world, that would mean in order to provide them with schooling and education, we would need to build 63,000 new classrooms every single week. I want you to ask yourself if we're even building 100 in a month. We're not. Around the world, we are not building 63,000 new classrooms every week, let alone in a month. And that's why our infrastructure is outdated because we don't even have the schools, the teachers, the educators, and the system of that civilization framework to educate those. Whether we're talking about higher education or those things, it's a hierarchy system divided into class that's not available and open for every human being. We are on one single planet. It is Spaceship Earth. We are all crew members, and therefore we need a solution for everyone to receive the basic rights of education, higher, lower level, period.
And if we try to come up with newfangled models to, to do education and that, which, which I have, I can gladly tell you what, what my opinion of those are, but we put them on a broken model, uh, a one that's set up for collapse and failure. That's exactly what's gonna happen. We're gonna be talking about this problem in a few years. So that's all I have to say to set up our discussion and our conversation. Wow. Thank you, Mark, on this very, very insightful speech. Uh, let's move to our next speaker. Our next speaker is supposed to be Mayada Adil, but she will join a little bit later. So we will go to Sultan Ahmed. Uh, Sultan is a passionate educator, amazing film producer, motivational speaker, and managing director, chief learner at LXL. So Sultan, could you tell us the youth today seems not so motivated to study as the previous generations were. How can this be addressed? And also, how do we use the influence of social media and the new media in education? Uh, thank you, Dora, for the question. And uh, it was a pleasure to listen to the perspective of Mark. I think Mark, when he was talking about, he was looking at it from a very uh, you know, futuristic, broad-based perspective. I'm an on-ground practitioner. I live in India. Uh, we have 300 million young people in this country. We have one and a half million schools in India. So if I genuinely believe that if we solve the problem of India in terms of education, we're solving almost one third of the world's problems of education and future. So I'm going to you know, focus my uh, comments specifically about South Asia and India, uh, because this is where my specialization lies. I believe that uh, one of the biggest challenges of uh, education, not just in India, in most parts of the world, is there is a lack of motivation for, a, for the youngsters to engage with education. You know, when I look at my grandfather's generation, Survival was a great motivation for them to get educated because a good education meant a job which gave them a survival. Uh, if I look at my parents' generation, security was a wonderful reason for them to uh, you know, work towards an education because they were looking at a secure future for themselves. You know, my generation and the, the younger ones who are coming out, for them, they've, already, they've not seen the problems of either uh, survival or security in a large parts of uh, you know, middle-class India and in mass, large, large parts of the middle class of the world. So they're not motivated to study. And I think one of the biggest challenges of education, the way we've designed it, is we make and we create and we're proud of creating selfish individuals. Right from the time the child is very little, till the time that they're growing up to be young adults. You know, it's always about my studies, my test, my assignments, uh, my promotion, my grades, my job. It's always about me. And eventually, when I have gotten my graduation and I'm getting out there into the world, I'm supposed to be a change maker. I'm supposed to be a team player. And for the goddamn 20 years of my life, you've given me, uh, you know, selfish training. I think this is a fundamental change that we need to bring about in education, that we need individuals to start focusing beyond themselves, beyond their families, to start looking at the society. Because if you look at any successful societal models of the past, it was always about educating to create a better life, not to create a livelihood. Unfortunately, We've relegated the entire process of education to getting a livelihood, that is getting a job, which I think is so sad. I think if I would want to make a fundamental change to the way education happens, and that would be more on, you know, focusing children and the young adults to live a better life. I, at this juncture, I want to also add on and juxtapose another point, and which is, you know, two of the largest change makers on the planet, number one is technology and the number two is migration. You know, we can have a debate which is number one or two, but these are the largest change makers. I have no clue uh, where these youngsters are going to live. If they're born in India, born in Africa, born in US, you, we have no clue which part of the world that they're going to live in. We need to be preparing this generation to live in a much more flatter world. Uh, and 
uh, introducing them to world cultures, to world stories, to world challenges, to world issues has to be done at a much more earlier uh, you know, phase in their lives. And uh, one of the work that I do is I'm a filmmaker and I make films. You know, I've been making films now for 10 years. And one thing that surprises me, I've traveled to some of the world's biggest children's film festivals all over the world, is one of the world's most influential mediums, which is films. We've somehow relegated it to only entertainment. You know, it has a power to change societies. It has a power to inform and educate. And somehow we don't make enough films. And that's the work that I do. So I, I genuinely believe that whether it's films or gaming, you know, bringing in stuff that engages children is what I would like to see more, not just at the school, but at the, the university levels and making education more relevant to a life and not a livelihood. So I leave that there and probably come back for questions later. Thank you, Sultan, so much on your speech. Uh, let's move to the next speaker, Aziz Abubakar. Aziz is UN Youth uh, Delegate, founder of the Climate Education Initiative Project. Aziz, how are you empowering human security through your organization? So I'm going to start with um, giving a bit of context. And um, before answering that question, um, with around 30 million internally displaced persons, refugees and asylum seekers representing almost one third of the world's refugee population, Africa is facing unprecedented humanitarian needs as a result of an overlap of crisis. Um, we have armed conflicts happening um, in parallel with poverty, climate change, food insecurity, and political instability. According to aid organization CARE, um, the aid organization CARE um, has a report called the uh, Breaking the Silence Report. And uh, this report says that there the, the 10 most underreported humanitarian crises in 2022 alone were all in Africa. This humanitarian crisis uh, received the least media attention over the year. African countries like Ang Angola, Ma Malawi, Chad, um, Zambia, Burundi, Zimbabwe, Mali, and the Central African Republic, amongst others, are experiencing the worst food insecurity ever due to weather, extreme weather, um, like droughts and cyclones. However, what we've seen um, as a young person is that young people in Africa have created initiatives to educate and demonstrate the power of education to transform human security for many vulnerable communities in Africa. And uh, as, if, as the founder of the Sustainable Solutions uh, for Green Growth Initiative, um, I'm co-creating different solutions to ensure human security for a lot of young people in my country, Nigeria. For example, I'm collaborating with the Climate Risk Research Foundation, Open Source Climates, and Earth Daily to empower young people through capacity building workshops. Uh, we're working on an hackathon called the Climate Change Risk Resilience Hackathon, and we're empowering people to develop um, physical risk models um, and also carry out resilience planning in order to plan for the future of education, um, looking at the context of climate change and other humanitarian crises. Um, and at the same time, um, some of the solutions that I have, first, I have carried out through my organization is uh, we've done a lot of grassroots outreaches. We've also done a lot of workshops, like, like hands-on workshops, like climate flex workshops to build the capacity of young people to truly understand climate change at a very young age and then use that to inform the decisions that they, they would make in the future. Because I personally think that if we're going to raise a future lead, if we're going to raise future leaders who would create sustainable solutions to change the narrative of the world, we would need to do this early on at the grassroots um, age. 
at the early stages of young people. And um, we, we, I believe that through you know, building the capacity of teachers to deliver strategic knowledge on the issue areas uh, like climate change, food insecurity, and just like the other speaker mentioned, uh, global issues, world issues. Um, I think that we, we truly can change the narrative and flip the script for the world. And um, some of the other things I do think we need to do is to ensure education is inclusive for all people. We need to think about race. We need to think about gender, sexual orientation, disability, and all of these backgrounds while creating education curricula. And I think that we need to truly in to integrate key issues like climate change in, in our education curricula at the early stages. Um, let me just um, pause on that for now, yeah. I think one of the biggest challenges for education anywhere in the world today is the priority of the governments. If we look at the kind of uh, per capita expenditure that happens, you know, as a percentage of the GDP of the countries, it's absolutely abysmal in most parts of the world, whether it's a developed world, developing world, or the underdeveloped world. Uh, governments and their agenda, uh, you know, I've I've had very close proximity of working with several governments in Central Asia, Middle East, and uh, in South Asia over the past several years. What I do realize is that uh, for governments, education, especially higher education, they love primary education. You know, they love that, you know, the kids go to school. They love that part of it. But the moment it comes to higher education is the youth. The more you have a youth that's educated, that's engaged, the more that they are going to be aware of issues the more they're gonna question issues. And that is not something that sits very well with most governments in the world. So one of the biggest hurdles of the future of education, I believe, is the priority of the governments. Uh, governments are actually happy to have children, uh, the youth not engaged with issues. While we talk about climate, while we talk about uh, you know, several other issues which we want the youth to be engaged with, uh, I can very clearly tell you from a fact, at least if you look at the closely the policies of government very clearly they're designed for youth not to engage with the with these issues so i think one of the biggest apathy of uh, the governments across the world and it has nothing to do with rich or poor countries it has to be across the board uh, they don't want the youth to be educated so if you ask me the single biggest challenge for the youth to be educated in future will be is just that the governments don't want them as much as they should thank you sultan mark you wanted to add something as well right if we're already getting into the debate and discussion, I'm 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 in really agreement with uh, my colleague. I th I think um, it's spot on. The biggest thing is there's so many built-in biases, and um, there isn't that diversity in our systems. And so, specifically for you taking the expertise and speaking about India and Asia is absolutely fabulous and in, in, in stating those numbers. It, it, it is a global, um, and I don't even want to mention problem. It's, it's a global, it needs to be global awareness because the, it, it doesn't matter if, if there are people anywhere on this planet who are not getting educated, higher level education, lower level education, then that suffering, that change, has a ripple effect across our entire planet. We are, have seen numerous studies from Hans Rosling, and who, who's passed away, sadly, and, and many others, that show that when we educate women and girls, when we educate the youth, when we make sure that everyone has equal rights, and that we're better stewards, we're better crew members of this spaceship Earth. We feed our families better. We care more about how we use products, how we consume, how we are stewards in the environment and our land. Uh, one thing that I, I really didn't get to get in in my opening remarks, which is, is something that we don't see, that I, I, I want to kind of hit the, hit the nail home a little bit about these uh, civilization frameworks that are built up on this hierarchy model. When a civilization is built up, whether let's say it's uh, 
Egypt or India or, or, or China or the United States. And they built up a civilization. The best example that I like is in the Middle East, where we know that uh, all those civilizations collapsed. And they're of the 32 that I mentioned in the collapse. When, when they built up those civilizations, they took peasant slave laborers and farmers from other places of the world to build up their civilizations. Well, today we're, we're using that same model for example, in the Middle East, in Dubai, in Saudi Arabia, different places. Qatar was just very interesting for the, the FIFA World Soccer game. They take people from other countries, other nationalities to build up their civilization, to build up their thing. They can be hospitality workers. They can be slaves, peasants, slavers. We put different labels on them but they're there to build it up and they don't have any buy-in into those civilization frameworks. The minute it's built up and they're no longer needed, they're, they're shipped back to where they came from or they're displaced somewhere else. And when you have people, humanity, us, you and the people on this call who don't have buy-in to the place that they're living, the place that they're getting educated, they're saying, I'm being educated because I'm going to stay here. I'm going to make my, my country profitable, thriving, sustainable to be around for others so that my children will have that good education so that it'll have that ripple effect around the world. Those civilizations collapse because if somebody knows they're not going to have a buy-in, they're not going to ever get out of their, their situation, then what happens? That's, that's a repetition of that same model. And we use it today all, all around the world. And those will lead to that collapse. And that's why I really wanted to hit the emphasis home. What, what models should we use? Well, um, I think if, if we just want to talk about the models that we put on whatever framework, I, I hope we achieve the, the, the good civilization framework. Um, some, some big things that are truly vital is we, one, need to understand thoroughly big history, because when we understand that, we can avoid collapse before. There is another uh, other thing that is, is really important. Most of my life, I've spent unlearning what is not true that I learned in school. I was taught things in, in my education, and I'm sure many of you are as well, that are just not true. Biases and things that creep into our educational system, and that's not how the world works. And then I think eco-literacy is very important. Uh, symbiosis literacy is, is, is very important because uh, we have this thing called the human condition, and it's, it's for every culture, every person on this planet, that it's this built-in fear that uh, places where we live is built in or a bias that, that gives us fear that we're fearing our other crew members of Spaceship Earth, other people around the world. We, there's this rising collective, this, this, this um, consciousness that's been seen that sees the Earth as a single organism, an organism divided amongst itself is doomed. We are all one planet. We are one civilization. We are one earth. We're all crew members on the spaceship earth. There's no passengers. And so when we have this, that's what I mean by symbiosis literacy, that um, it's not the misunderstanding of what Darwin meant with uh, natural selection, where it's survival of the fittest, natural selection, severe competition, only the strong survive. That's not what Darwin meant. It's actually symbiosis, that through compassion, collaboration, and cooperation, that's how we go far. That's how our world stays sustainable. That's how we can go on for a long time. And some of that is in big history and other is in, in ecological literacy and, and some of it is in systems literacy. How do we see the world as one system, one home to all of us? And then the last one is how I led is future literacy. What is the future we want to go to? So if, if we get the basic needs covered and we get the basis of, of how our education and 
the formation of evolution of life on earth should be and how we should interact as a species on this planet, then there's the thought of how long can we go into the future? How, how long can we survive? And what do the jobs and what do the, the cultures, what do the languages, what do those beautiful things that make our world so wonderful really look like? And how can we develop those instead of worrying about war and basic needs? If you, if you really thought about how much money we spend on war and how much time we waste thinking about the basic resources as individuals, instead of just living life on this beautiful planet, it's, it's sad. So that's kind of what I wanted to say. Yeah. Can I add in a point here? Just triggered Mark's uh, comments, just triggered a very interesting thought in my head, which I wanted to share. I, th I think the elitist nature of educators and uh, you know people who run universities and run the education systems, they, they tend to be very elitist and they distance themselves with the game-changing realities of our world. Uh, the academia stayed away from the whole world of film and entertainment. They stayed away from it and they looked at it as a different world. The academy has, stay, has stayed away from the social media. Uh, the academy has stayed away from the gaming industry. Uh, these are absolute influences of the youth. These are the ones in, with which the youth are engaging. I, I, I would love to see uh, the academy and the future of education being a lot more integrated or a lot more engaged with these worlds. Because if you look at the gaming world, it's an absolute parallel world that exists. It is that world which is a precursor to the metaverse that we're going to talk about today and in tomorrow. Uh, if you look at the social media world, they, they seem to have a you know arm's distance from the entire world of education. In fact, young children are told not to engage with social and digital media. You know, we don't look at media as good or bad. We media is a tool. How we use it, how effectively use it is, is what uh, you know, decides the outcomes. So I would like to believe that uh, the future of education, we do have very powerful, engaging, um, you know, worlds out there, which the youth does engage with, but we have not used them enough. So my effort as an individual has been to try and use film, but I would love to see more efforts like this happen through gaming industries, as well as through the social and digital media. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I also love that. I also love using uh, the latest innovations and, and VR and augmented reality and, and social media and apps to, to kind of educate and, and almost in a form of, of gamification um, bring, bring us into the future and kind of make make learning fun make it transitional i'm gonna, i want to give you one good example on that but then i want want to um kind of almost have a discussion with you on one other thing that i think is is kind of a, a negative for humanity on the game gamification side or the 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 competition side of gaming or kind of making it into a metaverse type of a situation and i want to see uh, what kind of thoughts you have on that as well. There's this movement around the world that's called Global Citizen, and it's an actual app, and, and it's a concert and events and, and kind of swag and thing. It is by Hugh Evans, but they host these wonderful con concerts around the world on poverty, hunger, on the sustainable development goals. And uh, they're, they're free. So if you're part of the Global Citizen app and and you say, oh, I'd like to go to a free concert for Justin Bieber or for uh, Shakira or whoever the wonderful new artists are today. Sorry, I'm not always up to speed. Um, um, you can do that by posting on social media through the app. You say, oh, I'd like to go. And then you get a, you kind of get a point uh, uh, in this gamification part of Global Citizens. And then they allow you to go to the concert for free or to get a hat or a shirt that says global citizens. But in that process through this post and this gamification, this social media, 
they give you information about people who are starving around the world, people who are suffering a hunger or vaccinations or, or whatever the, the topic of the time would be for sustainability, for environment, for the challenges that people are facing around the world and how can we help them through our voice and awareness, right? And, and it's just for one event they had here in Hamburg, Germany, where I'm coming from and where I live, was called Global Citizens. It was at the G20, pre-G20 event in, in Hamburg. 500 million people downloaded the app. 500 people took actions to try to go to the concert and they raised $2.5 billion just for that one event through this Global Citizens. Wow, that's pretty impressive for one app. But in that process, people learned about why they were concerned about the G20 or why we're concerned about the sustainable development goal. So I, I think there's ways to use innovations, gamification, competition in a good way to impact the problems that we're facing in our world moving forward. But the one thing that I didn't mention prior is I think a lot of our previous education system is based on competition and grading in a way that really leaves a lot of students behind, whether it's in, in, in the uh, higher education of colleges and universities or whether it's our youth that are um, knocked down or falsified on their grades coming up in the system. And so um, when I mentioned symbiosis, it was totally not about competition. We're not competing against each other. We're on the same journey, the same planet together. So how do you feel about how that works within education and and how can we still do that without feeling like we're competing against something? I have to take something away from you or win. And that means that you don't win as well. How do we make it a, a games theory, uh, a win-win for everyone? I think there's, uh, thanks, thanks, Mark. Very exciting on that. Uh, I'm just going to pick that up as a question from Padua, who says that there are many universities that have strong film schools. And that's exactly what uh, I'm trying to say is the opposite of what we need to do. Films need not be relegated to one course in a university. And I'll tell you why. Last year, in the year 22, I have statistics of 22. There were more videos uploaded on YouTube as one channel, uh, more than all books written in the history of mankind. So we, we know that we are creating and consuming visual content, you know, in the world. That's what we're doing. But when you put a three-year-old child or a four-year-old child to school, we only teach them to read and write. Visual storytelling is not something that we make it as an integral part of their education. You know, we wait for them to become 20 year olds and 18 year olds for them to learn filmmaking. I, I would want a child as young as three and four while they're learning their alphabets and speaking that they also learn to communicate through the visual storytelling and similarly engage with the other newer forms of media. The, the artificial intelligences, the humanoids, they need to start engaging with it. The earlier we allow children to engage with them, we remove the stigma of it being good or bad because we are now giving it to them as tools. We are not being judgmental about how they are using it. We, we are giving it to them as tools. And then the, and, and we need to have faith in, in the decision-making power of the youth and the youngsters for them to take the right calls. And they eventually land up doing that. All of us on this panel, whether it's Alberto or Mark, you know, Dora looks a little younger than all of us, but we've all been there and we've grown up well. We've turned up reasonably well. We've not really ruined our, ourselves and the world around us. So I think we need to trust that. And uh, so when we talk about engaging with, that's exactly what even Mark was saying. When we talk about engaging with newer, uh, you know, innovations, which is happening out there in the world, it's not like putting up a poster or just having one course in the university. And I think that's uh, that's what I meant about films or uh, Mark was talking about with artificial intelligence and AR and VR. Yeah, and I, I also wanted to add that um, 
leveraging uh, storytelling might, might also be a very good way to educate um, young people at the early stages. Um, one thing um, I do in my organization, the Sustainable Solutions for Green Growth, is to um, create these hands-on workshops where um, we have a group of young people, children, who um, use um, <clears throat> who use cards um, as a way to understand the causes and effects of climate change. And um, before we do that, actually, before we get on to it, as one one thing we do is to ask them what does climate change really mean uh, to them in their lives? Um, what does climate justice mean to them as well? So we would like to um, encourage them to tell the story um, about ways in which climate change has affected them. So allowing others to connect to the old issue of climate change, uh, um, seeing the bigger picture here and how every action they take could um, ultimately um, affect um, someone else um, in, a, in a different location entirely, right? So um, it's allowing them, what, what this has done is, is allowing them to think differently about the kind of actions they take at home. Um, one feedback we've gotten from parents is that they started to see the children now recommending to parents themselves um, to, to rather use um, a paper bag and then to use a plastic bag or just um, one sustainable step there, right? And um, you would also see um, children encouraging their parents to uh, probably use public transports rather than uh, using their own private vehicles. So now this, this is ultimately um, helping a lot of um, young people, um, a lot of families across the world, um, across uh, the, the continent rather, um, to um, take a bigger action together, more collectively, um, to address the climate crisis and you know the triple crisis of the humanitarian crisis, climate change, and food insecurity, right? So um, that's, that's one thing I would like to, to just share to, during this conversation. And yeah, just like, um, um, Matt um, might have already um, mentioned um, a global citizen. Uh, I was part of global citizen um, as a youth fellow, and yeah, just the way you explained this uh, was really well put. And one thing um, I personally also observed was that um, about the issue of gamification and you know the old app and all of that was that um, I've attended some of their conferences, uh, sorry, the, some of their con concerts rather, um, like the one in New York I did um, attended last year. And um, one thing I observed where that was that people, um, people were, were not necessarily taking actions because they really cared or, or they felt it mattered. Um, some of them were actually just taking actions because they wanted to just see their celebrities, you know, perform on stage and all of that. So um, I, I I feel like that that's that that's a huge gap, and it's kind of like um, you know like a reverse to what we actually want to uh, to have. We really want to want to have people care about these issues, right? Um, and not just use it as an opportunity to just you know, maybe see. You. See or get to um, you know, watch live performances or stuff like that. So yeah, I, I get. I guess that's one of the challenges that, that that comes out of reward the reward system, the gamification um, system that, um, when it comes to education. Thank you, Azaz. Uh, I would like to ask for any additional comments, ideas, or experiences that would like to be shared before the session is over. I, I'd love to say something. So um, the biggest thing that we really need to focus on is that um, <clears throat> We're not passengers on, on this spaceship Earth. We're all crew members. There's no single passenger, you know, whether we're a baby or uh, elderly. Um, 
we 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 play an important role. Um, there are examples <clears throat> of how to do it differently. And during the Brexit, during the pandemic, during the Ukraine war, uh, during um, all the crazy things that have happened uh, um, over the last few years, there's more and more awareness bubbling to the surface of humanity where we're saying that these systems that we've created, we're the ones who created them, are just not working for us all anymore. And that's why as, as we began this, is it's important to ask yourself this question, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? And let's see how we can create together the future of education and create a new framework for the future of education to write on that will work for everybody in this world because it needs to be an enabliable human right for everyone born to, to the right of a quality education. And if they don't have uh, food and water and, and a, a roof over their head, um, People don't care about education, but that's part of the process. That's that bigger picture of that infrastructure and that foundation that is needed to get there. And so I hope in the future we'll have solved those problems because a lot of people are thinking about that today. And um, we see just alone from Greta Thunberg, she said, I'm learning all these things in school but they don't practice it anywhere. They're teaching it to me in school, but it's all bullshit because none of them are doing anything that they're teaching me in school. They're acting like, oh, that's just history. That's just the facts. And then, you know, that's like telling your child the house is on fire and just going about your daily job. Uh, and so that's why she started a strike. And I think that's the same thing that's occurring all over the world. People are saying, What's going on? This is insanity. We need a different system. And, uh, uh, and we need a global system because we're a global civilization. We're a global humanity. We need something that works for all of us. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't have cultures and biodiversity and religion and languages and all those beautiful things that make us who we are. But it just means that we raise the bar higher, that all the basic needs and the basic things that we require, security, food, water, livability, roof over our head, education, um, that they're there. Because that, when we have those, we treat our planet better. And when we treat our planet better, we treat ourselves better. Because I promise you, I wasn't dropped off with Spaceship Germany or Spaceship America and my colleagues wasn't dro dropped off in Spaceship India. We crawled out of the primordial soup of this earth. We are all star stuff. The basic elements in our bodies are the basic elements in our earth. And yes, I was born from my mother. But if we take it all the way back, we crawled out of the primordial soup of this earth. More and the basic materials and the majority of my body are microorganisms that are the basic elements found in the dirt right around my feet where I was born. I want, want you to know we can do this. And I'd love to be on the journey with you guys because I know you know a heck of a lot more than I do. But I'd love to spark your ideas and thoughts. And thanks for my colleagues. Thank you, uh, Mark. I just want to add one point. The fact of the matter is that nine out of 10 young people on this planet don't get an opportunity to get into a good university. So that one individual who's going into university, you are not studying for yourself. You're studying for an entire generation sometimes. You know, you're the lucky person who had an opportunity to get into university. I don't think universities are instilling enough into those young people that they're the privileged ones to be going into university. They're the ones who carry a responsibility far greater than just getting a job for themselves. Uh, I think it's so important for universities to start focusing on building global citizens. We use this word, but I don't think we do enough in encouraging young people to take up challenges of the world. So the privileged ones 
you know, coming from a country like India, I can very clearly say that, you know, if you're going to a university, you're the privileged one, then your responsibility is not just to build your own future, but to actually support a lot of others and safeguard the future of this world as well. Well, uh, thank you. Our time uh, is uh, ending. Uh, I fully agree with what I heard. Uh, and uh, to my ears, uh, you have been articulating uh, in different ways uh, some of the big barriers, which is the use of power. We know, for example, that traditional education is uh, not really e effective uh, in uh, promoting learning. And we have 80 years of research showing the student-centered, the person-centered, people-centered education is, gets much better results. Why is not more widely applicated? Because the issue is power. You know, the traditional education is professor-centered. And usually on this planet, people that have a lot of power don't like to speak about power nor to share. But Mark and others of you have shown that you can self-organize it like the beautiful example of the global citizen. And, and so the thing is that, that uh, and this is uh, about the, the sustainability goals, uh, about the education, that uh, Promotion of change is effective if done through action of empowerment. And here, I think we are all together in the same game. Are we going to survive? <laughs> are we going to stop worrying and making war to parts of ourselves, to others, to plants and animals of this planet? So now it's the moment to decide how to use our personal power and organizational power to be part of the problem or the solution. By the way, effective education, in my opinion, would also teach about that if I'm alive today, no matter how many years old I am, I have some responsibility, not only rights, but responsibility for the future generation. By the way, we are promoting a, a discussion probably in September at the UN. The Board of Trustees just endorsed it a couple of months ago what another sister organization has been promoting, the Declaration of Responsibility for Present Generation to Future Generation. Thank you personally, as a world citizen, for what you're doing in their daily life. And we need... 10 millions more of people like you and change would be more visible. Thank you. Thank you very much.